Hello, my name is Professor David Andrew Tizard. Welcome to this first lecture in a course at Hanyang University, Seoul, South Korea, uh, entitled An Introduction to Political Science. Uh, there'll be more information about the course on the uh, university website and for the assignments, things like that. I'll do that at the end of the videos for now. <clears throat> I'm more going to get straight into the content. Now, for an introduction to political science, we're trying to understand how politics works and how people have theorized and debated it over the millennia. Uh, most courses that you study on this, or if you look at syllabi across the globe, they'll start in antiquity. They'll often look at, say, Plato uh, for the Western tradition, uh, Confucius, Mencius for the Eastern tradition, and sometimes Cotillia from India as well. Uh, I'm not intending to do that too much. I don't want to take uh, too much of a chronological approach. Uh, I'd rather just sort of jump around as the human mind works and, and pick things out that seem uh, interesting and relevant. More importantly, with our first uh, lecture today on this introduction to political science, we're going to start uh, with a chapter from a book called The Coddling of the American mind. So we're going to start very much in the present, enable that to give us uh, some better understanding before we go delving deep into uh, ideas of people. We, we need to know a little bit more who we are, how we think and what we're doing when we approach these things. So that's the aim of this. Um, for those of you that have not read the chapter or even the book yet, I would actually highly suggest uh, reading as much of them as you can. Uh, they don't pay me any commission, but the, the Righteous Mind and The Coddling of the American Mind, are both, you know, decent books. They're not the best books in the world, but they're books that will make you think about the way you think. They're books that will make you think about how you see the world, you know, so uh, they can be rather useful <clears throat> in that aspect. If you haven't read the chapter yet, please read the chapter. Uh, before you continue with the video, because otherwise you're just going to be too influenced by what I say. Um, one thing that is not covered in this chapter, but is referenced, so one of the points of the book is this. Um, Haidt, uh, Jonathan Haidt brings this in one of his other books. He comes up with the idea, the elephant and the rider. And what he's essentially suggesting here is that we are not one. We have this idea of the self, the I, you know, back from that Cartesian, I think, therefore I am, you know. And what Haidt is doing is very similar to Daniel Kahneman's work in Thinking Fast and Slow. You can also see maybe Nietzsche with the Apollo, the Apollyon and the Dionysian going into Freud or Carl Jung, things like that. The idea that the self is made up of different parts, okay? So we're not one but we're multiple. And what Jonathan Haidt uh, explains, or he tries to suggest one of his hypotheses, is that uh, we're composed of a rider and an elephant. The elephant, you can see in the picture, is our emotional brain. The elephant is what is powerful. It pulls us around and, you know, we react as humans. We see something that makes us upset and we immediately uh, get pulled towards that. It, it brings up emotions in us. Um, it's slightly uncontrollable, you know, and it's prone to going where it wants. We also have the uh, the rational brain, which is the rider. And the rider sits on top of the elephant, tries to steer it around, but obviously the elephant is more powerful than the rider, and the, the rider can only do so much. The rider can encourage and prompt if the rider is very skillful control it but ultimately the elephant has a lot of power it sounds a bit strange of course it, it, it's a metaphor it you know it's trying to describe the way you work but just consider you know when you have work to do and you know you've got to do the work but your elephant just wants to sit down you know your elephant wants to go through youtube your elephant wants to go and see the suggested videos over there and just go, i wonder what else i can do on youtube and that's your elephant talking. Your rider finds it very hard to control that. You know, we're, we're emotionally driven. We're instinctively driven. It's hard to control what we do. Um, in terms of politics, though, this is important because we like to imagine that we're always rational. We, we like to imagine that all of our decisions are purely 
uh, ration based, logic based, and through that, you know, we always see other people as being uh, blinded by ideology, but we perceive ourselves to be free and objective. Yeah? One of the uh, famous descriptions of ideology is it's like breath. You can smell other people's, but you cannot smell your own. And it seems very true. You know when other people have been drinking coffee, when they've been smoking, when they've been eating garlic, when they've been drinking soju. You get it, right? You, it's, it's very apparent. It's very obvious to you. Um, it's not so obvious to you when it's your own thing. And that's the same with um, ideology and objectivity, subjectivity. We can see very clearly, ah, oh, that person's really conservative. Ah, oh, that person's really woke or progressive. That person is very anti-capitalist. We can see those things, but we don't see our own as easily. And so one of the things with this is trying to see our own uh, ideologies, trying to see how we perceive that. And, and that's why these books are interesting, because they think, they make you think about how you think they make you evaluate how you judge other ideas which i think there's a lot of value uh, to be had from that just with the the rider and the elephant uh it's also mentioned elsewhere in this book is that when we converse with other people communicate with other people one of the things that we often do is we try to reason with them you know we try to appeal to people's rational brain. You might be on Twitter, you might be on social media, wherever you might be, and then you, you try to reason with somebody. And it doesn't work and it doesn't get through. That's because the elephants are, are, are ruling and, and driving the thing. And so one, and that makes you more frustrated, obviously. One of the techniques he, he talks about is, you know, you have to appeal to the elephant sometimes. You have to appeal to people's emotions before you can get through to them rationally you know you have to get to them you have to get their hearts and minds before they'll listen to you and so that's a very big challenge but you'll see it mentioned in chapter three which we're going to study today this idea of the rider and the elephant um so it's the idea that we're driven by rationality and we're also driven by emotions and you know that's Nietzsche this would be the Apollyon, you know, the Apollo thing and the Dionysius driving us. Uh, Daniel Kahneman in his book Thinking Fast and Slow, it's a very interesting book worth reading, uh, would classify uh, this as the slow thinking and this as the fast thinking that, that works through that way. Um, so that's just as a brief introduction now. <clears throat> Our point is to uh, go through chapter three. Uh, for this week and see what we can make of it. Chapter three is entitled The Untruth of Us Versus Them. Life is a battle between good people, evil people. It starts with this quote from Rabbi Lord Jonathan Sachs. There is the moral dualism that sees good and evil as instincts within us between which we must choose. But there is also what I will call pathological dualism that sees humanity itself as radically divided into the unimpeachably good and the irredeemably bad. You are either one or the other. So life is a battle between good people and bad people. This is the suggestion here. And you can see a lot of this, I think, in modern politics. It doesn't matter sort of what country uh, you might be from, but the right and the left are finding it harder for each other to communicate with each other or to accept each other's ideas. You, it's gone beyond this idea where, you know, we may differ on these things, but we'll sit down and have dinner together. That being able to sit down and have dinner and communicate with each other uh, on a whole range of topics, whether it's, uh, you know, strictly political based on uh, voting and, and democracy, whether it's based on that more global issues, global warming or immigration, whether it's based on um, cultural or social issues such as abortion or issues related to LGBTQI plus and those things. It, there is this idea that we are the good and you are the, e the evil and, and that's come in. And so this uh, is described by Rabbi Lord Jonathan Sachs as pathological dualism, dividing the world into two parts the good and the bad yeah and this is me and this is you by the way i'm using a mouse to do this so if it looks terrible that's why 
So this is the idea that we're presented with, that the world is divided into good or bad people. Let's see how it progresses. <clears throat> a protest is always a claim that injustice is being done. When a group forms to protest together, they jointly construct a narrative about what is wrong, who is to blame, and what must be done to make things right. Reality is always more complicated than the narrative, however, and as a result, people are demonised or lionised, often unfairly. One such case happened in October 2015 at Claremont McKenna College near Los Angeles. Well, let's have a look here. So we have this term of a narrative, right? And what, and what is Haidt saying about a narrative? Narrative is different from reality. So you're, you're presented with two points. You're presented with the reality... Uh, and I'll buy a pen soon, I promise. You're presented with a reality and you're presented with a narrative. Height differentiates them by saying that here, reality is more complicated than the narrative. Reality is very grey, reality is messy, reality is nuanced. But the narrative, it's the narrative that divides, you know, these are the goods and these are the bads. And how does this narrative come about? A narrative being a story. So, you know, that's why they're demonized or lionized. It's allegorical. It, it's sort of going into George Orwell's Animal Farm. You know, they're the pigs and we're the kids. We're ji dul if you get into Korean politics, right? We're the, we're the pigs and dogs and they're the fat cats or the elites. How is this done? Well, when a group joins together, when a group forms, they jointly construct a narrative. So a narrative is a social or a joint construction. It's something that is uh, comes together through a collection of people. It's not if one person has an idea, but when a group come together, they can construct a narrative. Okay, so if you get into this idea of constructing narratives, the world is construction. Um, you could look at constructivism, which would be in, in Korean, there's gusongjui. The work of Alexander Venn in uh, International Relations. Uh, great articles about anarchy is what the state makes of it. Uh, you could see um, uh, Berger and Luckman's the, the Social Construction of Reality. is a very interesting book from the 1960s. bit harder to read. Some great ideas in there. But the idea that things are constructed. We construct stories about each other. Yeah. So these are these people and these are that. Why do we do that? Because... Reality is messy and narratives are easy. We understand stories, we understand fables, and if there's an easily identifiable good guy and an easily identifiable bad guy, then it makes so much more sense. We don't have to think. It's laid out for us. So you're getting these words here just to make sure that you can pay attention to them. Let's have a, a look at this example that is presented. A student named Olivia, whose parents emigrated from Mexico to California before she was born, wrote an essay in a student publication about her feelings of marginalization and exclusion. Olivia noticed that Latinos were better represented on the blue collar staff at CMC, including janitors and gardeners, than among its administrative and professional staff, and she found this realization painful. She wrote that she felt like she had been admitted to fill a racial quota. She suggested that there is a standard or typical person at CMC, and she is not it. Our campus, climate, and institutional culture are primarily grounded in Western white, cis-heteronormative, upper-to-upper-middle-class values. Cis-heteronormative describes a society in which people assume that other people are not transgender and not gay unless there is information to the contrary. In response to this es essay, which Olivia sent in an email to CMC staff, Mary Spellman, the Dean of Students at CMC, sent her a private email two days later. Here is the entire email. Olivia, thank you for writing and sharing this article with me. We have a lot to do as a college and community. Would you be willing to talk with me sometime about these issues? They are important to me and the Dean of Students staff, and we are working on how we can better serve students, especially those who don't fit our CMC mould. I would love to talk with you more, best Dean Spellman. What do you think about Dean Spellman's email? Cruel or kind? Most readers can probably see that she was showing concern and reaching out with an offer to listen and help, but Olivia was offended by the Dean's use of the word mould. She seemed to interpret it in the least generous way possible, that Spellman was implying that Olivia and other students of colour do not fit the mould and therefore do not belong at CMC. 
This was clearly not Spellman's intent. Olivia herself had asserted that at CMC there is a prototype or pattern of identities that she does not match, and as Spellman later explained, she used the word mold to express her empathy with Olivia, because it's a word that other CMC students use in conversations with her to describe their sense of not fitting in. So the problem was with the word mold. But the point here that you want to be looking at uh, soon is that she seemed to interpret it in the least generous way possible. This is not to say whether somebody is right or wrong, but we have the ability to see information like this, okay, and how we interpret it. Do we immediately jump to uh, conclusions of being offended or do we try to take the most generous pop possible interpretation? That's all our choice. You know, that's something we we look at. So that's something that um, the authors are trying to focus on here. I press these buttons. Any student who is already feeling like an outsider might well feel a flash of negativity upon reading the word mold. But what should one do with that flash? There is a principle in philosophy and rhetoric called the principle of charity, which says that one should interpret other people's statements in their best, most reasonable form, not in the worst or most offensive way possible. Had Olivia been taught to judge people primarily on their intentions, she could have used the principle of charity in this situation. As described in the previous chapter, if a student in Olivia's position was in the habit of questioning her initial reactions, looking for evidence and giving people the benefit of the doubt, that student might get past her initial flash of emotion and avail herself of an invitation from a dean who wanted to know what she could do to address the student's concern. So if it makes sense to you uh, already, that flash that is talking uh, is being this initial flash of emotion that comes up uh, that's the elephant we you know this initial reaction comes up we're driven by something we might love it we might hate it but there's this initial reaction that comes up and reacting on that rather than reacting on the rational approach can be rather problematic some people would say uh, you know, I, I've seen this word go around that, that we live uh, in, again, I'm writing with this pen, this mouse, we live in democracy, right? So rather than a democracy, an democracy. Crassy, the word crassy means rule, yeah, or power. So when you have uh, demo, democracy, the rule, the rule of the demo, yeah? And the demo, of course, means masses, right? Demo, the rule of the masses, the rule of the debubun, the majority. You can have a bureaucracy, which is ruled by paper, by the bureaus. Or an democracy, which is a rule by emotion. You know, we live in a society where emotions are, are quick to flare, which is natural. I'm not saying that that's a bad thing, but it's when they rule rather than the rider controlling them. So, you know, it's something worth looking into some people might favor emotions other people might favor rationality that's for you to think about yourself so what did olivia do with this olivia posted spellman's email on her facebook page about two weeks after receiving it with the comment i just don't fit that wonderful cmc mold feel free to share her friends did share the email and the campus erupted in protest there were marches, demonstrations, demands given to the president for mandatory diversity training and demands that Spellman resign. Two students went on a hunger strike vowing that they would not eat until Spellman was gone. In one scene, which you can watch on YouTube, students formed a circle and spent over an hour airing their grievances through bullhorns against Spellman and other administrators who were there in the circle to listen. Spellman apologised for her, e her email being poorly worded and told the crowd that her intention was to affirm the feelings and experiences expressed in the article and to provide support. But the student did not accept her apology. At one point, a woman berated the dean to cheers from the students for falling asleep during the proceedings, which the woman interpreted as an act of disrespect. But it is clear from the video of the confrontation that Spellman was not falling asleep. She was trying to hold back her tears. The university did not fire Spellman, but neither did its leaders publicly express any support for her. 
faced with the escalating anger of students, amplified by social media and then by national news coverage, Spellman resigned. So uh, the conclusion to this example that they point out is uh, this email uh, would lose somebody their job. Why? It's not the email itself. It's not the ideas. It's the reactions to the ideas. OK, so it's how uh, people interpret and react to things. As this was happening, another conflict over an email was unfolding at Yale. Erica Christakis, a lecturer at the Yale Child Study Center, an associate master of Silliman College, one of Yale's residential colleges, wrote an email questioning whether it was appropriate for Yale administrators to give guidance to students about appropriate and inappropriate Halloween costumes, as the college dean's office had done. Christakis praised their spirit of avoiding hurt and offence, but she worried that the growing tendency to cultivate vulnerability in the students carries unacknowledged costs. She expressed concern about the institutional exercise of implied control over college students and invited the community to reflect on whether, as adults, they could set norms for themselves and handle disagreements interpersonally. Talk to each other, she wrote. Free speech and the ability to tolerate offence are the hallmarks of a free an open society. Uh, so the, the point of this email that they've tried to highlight is the growing tendency to cultivate vulnerability in students carries unacknowledged costs. So if we uh, present or if society, I should say, if society presents people as vulnerable, if society presents people as not able or not capable of dealing with certain ideas or certain information, then there will be ramifications and there will be effects of presenting people as vulnerable. So if we suggest to people that, yes, you might not be able to take these ideas or take this information, then that might actually become true. There might be results or consequences of giving that to students. What they might be, well, there have been some studies, or you can look closer into that, but rather than portraying people as uh, incapable of taking certain ideas, uh, it's asking them that the students control them themselves. There's a, a nice quote by Aristotle, as much of a quote by Aristotle as you can get, I think, considering the time distance. He said, it is the mark of an educated mind to be able to entertain an idea without accepting it. What he's suggesting there is that you should be able to think through a whole load of things. You know, it doesn't mean you have to like them. It doesn't mean you have to accept them personally. But there needs to be ideas. There need to be ideas that you should be able to sit down and think through in an educated way without being uh, offended or without feeling that they're sort of aggressive or violent or things like that because ultimately they are just ideas in that sense of course ideas are very powerful they can be constructed narratives and to some people ideas can be violent but during this course we're going to go through a lot of different ideas you know people like Cotillia or Han Fei Zhu or Machiavelli their ideas are not always you know pleasant or even if you look at Plato's work on, on eugenics or things like that, you know, it's not always something that you might find particularly nice, but they're ideas, okay? And so the idea here is that we should not, uh, according to Christakis, we should not cultivate vulnerability in students. We should not promote that the idea that students are vulnerable. <clears throat> What happened with this email? The email sparked an angry response from some students who interpreted as an indication that Christakis was in favor of racist costumes. A few days later, a group of roughly 150 students appeared in the courtyard outside Christakis's home within Silliman College, writing statements in chalk, including, we know where you live. Erica's husband, Nicholas Christakis, was the master of Silliman, a title that has since been changed to head of college, when he came out to the courtyard, students demanded that he apologize for and renounce his wife's email. Nicholas listened, engaged them in dialogue with them and apologized several times for causing them pain. But he refused to renounce his wife's email or the ideas it espoused. Students accused him and Erica of being racist and offensive, stripping people of their humanity, 
creating an unsafe space and enabling violence. They swore at him, criticised him for not listening and for not remembering students' names. They told him not to smile, lean down or gesticulate. And they told him they wanted him to lose his job. Eventually, in a scene that went viral, one student screamed at him, Who hired you? You should step down. It is not about creating an intellectual space. It is not. It's about creating a home here. You should not sleep at night. You are disgusting. Uh, and of course, this is a, an educational place. And it's about the changing. One of the things here is... Um, to what is the purpose of an educational space? You know, this will come to it soon. But uh, the students are saying it's not about an intellectual space. It's about creating a home. OK, so if you take the idea of a university, uh, let's take Hanyang University where we're doing this course. What is the purpose of Hanyang University? If we have, you know, 75 students in the class, there's going to be a lot of different answers. So, you know, how can we get through all of these? What is the purpose or what, what is the goal of Hanyang University? Is it to educate you? Is it to socialize you? Is it to instill morals? Is it to um, train you to interact with other people? Is it to help you get a job in the future? Is it to keep you passive so you're not all running about in society causing trouble and demanding revolutions? Lots of different answers. One of the, the things um, that Aristotle looked at was the idea of a telos. Okay, So the telos of something. The telos means the... It can be described a few different ways, but you could have the aim or the goal of something. Nietzsche also used this idea a lot you know, with the will of something. But the telos is the aim or goal of something. So if you take a pen, for example, is this a good pen? Well, if you start looking at the colors of it, if you start looking at the shape and the feel, all these type of things, you're missing the point, Aristotle would say. What is the telos of the pen? What is the aim or the goal? The aim or the goal for the pen is to be able to write. So if the pen writes, then it's a good pen. If the pen doesn't write, it's a bad pen, even if it has bells and whistles and things like that. Uh, so the pen has a very specific telos, and we can highlight that and then say whether it's good or bad according to that. So what would be the telos of a university? And is that telos changing over time? You know, Is it an absolute thing? Is it decided by the the people that organize it or is it decided by the students is it decided by the administration administrative staff is it decided by a national culture so you know what is the purpose of a university what is the purpose of this course the next day the president of the university sent out an email acknowledging students pain and committing to take actions that will make us better he did not mention any support for the Christakis until weeks after the courtyard incident, by which time attitudes against the couple were entrenched. Amid ongoing demands that they be fired, Erica resigned from her teaching position. Nicholas took a sabbatical from teaching for the rest of the year, and at the end of the school year, the pair resigned from their positions in the residential college. Erica later revealed that many professors were very supportive privately, but were unwilling to defend or support the Christakis's publicly because they thought it was too risky and they feared retribution. Why did students react so strongly to the emails from Dean Spellman and Erica Christakis, both of which were clearly intended to be helpful to students? Of course, there was a backstory at each school. There were incidents of racism or other reasons why some students were frustrated with the administration. The protests were not just about the emails, but as far as we can tell, those backstories don't involve Spellman or Christakis. So why did students interpret the emails of, as offences so grave that they justified calls for their authors to be fired? It's as though some of the victims had their own mental prototype, a schema with two boxes to fill, victim and oppressor. Everyone is placed into one box or the other. So that duality idea is coming back, you know, the good people and the bad people, the victim and oppressor. It's one way of seeing the world. Now, a couple of people will go into uh, some of the uh, Polish psychologist studies. Um, a couple of people have also used this victim and oppressor one. Um, start with Nietzsche. 
uh, Nietzsche looked at this victim and presser one in relation to Christianity and the Roman Empire. So at the time, uh, you know, the Christians were persecuted. The Christians didn't have the ability to overpower the Roman Emperor. And so what they did is, because they couldn't get political or military power, uh, this is according to Nietzsche, by the way, this is Nietzsche's interpretation. He, he said that they decided to get moral power. And the way they did this, the way they got moral power was to present themselves as the uh, the victims, present themselves as the oppressed and, and, and the Roman empires as the oppressors. And therefore they would have the, the moral high ground. OK, and that's why Nietzsche was very critical of Christianity at many points. He called it a slave mentality. A group of people um, in that historical period, I'm not talking about the modern time, but in that historical period, they willingly enslaved themselves and made themselves lower and smaller. They made themselves the victims so that they could have the, the moral high ground over the people that were more powerful than them because they couldn't, you know, they couldn't usurp them politically, economically or militarily. So they took a moral stance and presented themselves that way. That's what Nietzsche has said about this. Michel Foucault has often, you know, described this, that everything is power, you know, and it's between the victims and the oppressors. And there's there's always power involved. We could keep going, but let's ha let's have a look at what the book says about groups and tribes. There's a famous series of experiments in social psychology called the Minimal Group Paradigm, pioneered by a Polish psychologist, Henry Tajfel, who served in the French army during World War II and became a prisoner of war in Germany. Profoundly affected by his experiences as a Jew during that period in Europe, including having his entire family in Poland murdered by the Nazis, Tajfel wanted to understand the conditions under which people would discriminate against members of an out group. So in the 1960s, he conducted a series of experiments each of which began by dividing people into two groups based on trivial and arbitrary criteria, such as flipping a coin. For example, in one study, each person first estimated the number of dots on a page. Irrespective of their estimations, half were told that they had overestimated the number of dots and were put into a group of overestimators. The other half were sent to the underestimators group. Next, subjects were asked to distribute points or money to all the other subjects, who are identified only by their group membership. Tajfel found that no matter how trivial or minimal he made the distinctions between the groups, people tended to distribute whatever was offered in favour of their in-group members. So once people are placed into groups, and it doesn't matter if the groups, what they're based on, it could be something trivial. It could even be something false. So in his study, it didn't actually matter what number they said. He just decided you that way, you that way. It was arbitrarily des designed right, in that sense. But once they were in these groups that were selected just randomly and nonsensely right, in a nonsense manner, then he found that people, when they were asked to distribute and act, uh, amongst the entire group, they favoured their own. Even though the group that had been assigned to them was completely random, the people generally favoured their own. Just before I continue, uh, if you're interested in, in the psychology of things like Auschwitz or the, uh, you know, the, the tragedy of the Jewish experience during uh, World War II, you might look at Viktor Frankl's book, uh, which is entitled, I believe, Man's Search for Meaning, I believe it's called. Uh, I shouldn't write names in red, but I will continue to do it. Look for Viktor Frankl's Man's Search for Meaning. It's a wonderful psychological uh, exploration of what happens in those things. So, and, uh, <laughs> There we go. Sorry, computer. Later studies have used a variety of techniques to reach the same conclusion. Neuroscientist David Eagleman used functional magnetic reasoning resonance imaging to examine the brains of people who were watching videos of other people's hands getting pricked by a needle or touched by a Q-tip. 
when the hand being pricked by a needle was labelled with the participant's own religion, the area of the participant's brain that handles pain showed a larger spike of activity when the hand was labelled with a different religion. When arbitrary groups were created, such as by flipping a coin, immediately before the subject entered the MRI machine, and the hand being pricked was labelled as belonging to the same arbitrary group as the participant, even though the group hadn't e even existed just moments earlier, the participant's brain still showed a larger spike. We just don't feel as much empathy for those we see as other. So even in the brain, they're determining that when we see people that we've been grouped with getting hurt, we feel it more. And if we see people that are not in our group getting hurt, we don't feel it as much. We feel different. It might be the same um, action of pricking someone's hand with a needle applied to two different people. When we see it applied to you know, someone that we are associated with, we feel that more than when we see someone we are not associated with. So here you've got this idea of the other, okay? The other, which again creates this sort of us and them dichotomy. In a lot of social science, you'll see this, this capitalized other. Uh, a lot of sort of South Korean political uh, history, especially in the second half of the 20th century, was about the other. It was about labeling the, you know, the South would make the North Koreans the other. And what they would do is they would define themselves in opposition to the other. If South Korea was this, then North Korea was that. They would dehumanize each other. You know, they would use names. You know what the names are, call them reds or puppets or things like this. They, they wouldn't use people's actual names. It was all about dehumanizing things. And one of the reasons that totalitarian governments or, or people like to dehumanize things and call people names. So when you're when you're online and if you see, you know, abusive political names, whether it's political, social, cultural, there are names for the other side. Right. And it doesn't matter what side you're on. Both both people have names for the other side, whether it's the conservatives talking about the progressives, progressives talking about the conservatives, you know, the Pax Hamas, the, the, it all goes, whether it's the feminists talking about the anti-feminists, they're always names. And why is this problematic or why is it used? Because when you use these names, there's less empathy for the other side. It's scientifically, well, some studies have have shown that you just don't feel pain or empathy for these people because we see them as other and that may be not our fault you know that's not our fault because we're designed like that we have this group tribalism which is what they're going to say next the bottom line reading the bottom line is that the human mind is prepared for tribalism human evolution is not just the story of individuals competing with other individuals within each group it's also the story of groups competing with other groups, sometimes violently. We are all descended from people who belong to groups that were consistently better at winning that competition. Tribalism is our evolutionary endowment for banding together to prepare for intergroup conflict. When the tribe switch is activated, we bind ourselves more tightly to the group. We embrace and defend the group's moral matrix and we stop thinking for ourselves. A basic principle of moral psychology is that morality binds and blinds, which is a useful trick for a group gearing up for a battle between us and them. In tribal mode, we seem to go blind to arguments and information that challenge our team's narrative. Merging with the group in this way is deeply pleasurable, as you can see from the pseudo tribal antics that accompany college football games so when we go deeper into these tribes okay when we when we sort of really embed ourselves into these tribes and tribes are part of our evolutionary history we're used to that we're used to being pitted against other people it's suggesting that's why we still like football maybe it's like you know the k-pop fans they like to stand their own people and hate on the other on the other ones you know it's something deeply bedded in us biologically um, but the deeper that we go into these tribes, then it says we become stuck. It binds us and it blinds us. We're unable to see the other side. We go blind to arguments and information that, you know, we should really think about. But we, we become unable to see them because we've gone deeper into the group.
the tribe. However, being prepared for tribalism doesn't mean we have to live in tribal ways. The human mind contains many evolved cognitive tools. We don't use all of them all the time, we draw on our toolbox as needed. Local conditions can turn the tribalism up, down or off. Any kind of intergroup conflict, real or perceived, immediately turns tribalism up, making people highly attentive to signs that reveal which team another person is on. Traitors are punished and fraternizing with the enemy is too. Conditions of peace and prosperity, in contrast, generally turn down the tribalism. People don't need to track group membership as vigilantly. They don't feel pressured to conform to group expectations as closely. When a community succeeds in turning down everyone's tribal circuits, there is more room for individuals to construct lives of their own choosing. There is more freedom for a creative mixing of people and ideas. So what we're learning is that um, these tribal signals, uh, these tribal signals, you know, will go up and down. Right? These local conditions. Local conditions can turn the tribalism up, down, or perhaps even it says off. And in terms of tribalism, we, you know, we become very on edge and we're looking for our team and we're trying to get the other team. It's very collective. So when tribalism, you know, if this is tribalism, when tribalism is very high, we become, or humans become, very collective. Yeah, the collective idea goes up. The us and them comes up. When tribalism is very low during conditions of peace and prosperity, um, we don't need to conform. So we don't have these group expectations, it's saying. And therefore, there is more room for individuals to construct their own life. There's more creativity. So when tribalism is low in a society, then there will be more individual uh, focus is, is what it's saying here and so it's not just you know on or off it goes up and down in a wave and different things will turn these up and down in a wave the local conditions can either encourage tribalism or push tribalism down now think about perhaps your own country some of the own political situations you might realize that if you were a politician and you wanted support it might pay you to turn tribalism up because if your group is rather large then if you get together then your group will defeat the other tribes so when you see let's say rise of right-wing parties or left-wing parties excuse me when you see nationalism uh, and things like this ethno-nationalism coming up it might be political parties exacerbating the local conditions so that they can turn the tribalism up so that they can make these collective things come out and therefore generate more support for their party in elections and at the polls so you know do you value the collective or do you value the individual according to that you'll turn up the tribalism or you'll turn down the tribalism so it can go up and down So what happens to a community such as a college or increasingly a high school when distinctions between groups are not trivial and arbitrary and when they are emphasized rather than downplayed? What happens when you train students to see others and themselves as members of distinct groups defined by race, gender and other socially significant factors? And you tell them that these groups are internally engaged in a zero sum conflict over status and resources. Let's find out. I mean, while I have some water, I've been talking a lot today. Identity politics. So you might have heard this, but uh, we'll start here. It gives us a definition, at least, that we can work with. Identity politics is a contentious term, but its basic meaning is simple. Jonathan Rauch, a scholar at the Brookings Institute, defines it as political mobilization organized around group characteristics such as race, gender and sexuality as opposed to party ideology or pecuniary interest. He notes that in America, this sort of mobilization is not new, unusual, un-American, illegitimate, nefarious, or particularly left-wing. Politics is all about groups forming coalitions to achieve their goals. If cattle ranchers, wine enthusiasts, or libertarians banding together to promote their interests is normal politics, then women, African Americans, or gay people banding together is normal politics too. So, identity politics de de 
defined as you know we always have groups whether it's right wing or left wing uh, whether it's the cattle ranchers whether it's the you know in the marxist terms if it's the proletariat if it's the bourgeoisie there's there's always political groups economic groups social groups identity politics is when these groups is defined here uh, when these groups are de defined by race gender and sexuality so you group people in society not according to their their party their political party or ideology but they're grouped according to whether you're male female white brown black straight not straight and all of these other things so that's one of the definitions of ID identity politics i think it's fair to say that that's becoming more prevalent more common uh, you see more of it at least uh, in the modern world and we need to try to think does that make any differences because we're always tribal we're still being or people are still being tribal it's just the nature of the tribes has changed that how what they're composed of the fence around them instead of being the party or the ideology you know the communist versus the capitalist which was the cold war instead of it being that kind of ideology now it's based on identity so you want to see what difference that makes how identity is mobilized makes an enormous difference for the group's odds of success for the welfare of the people who join the movement and for the country identity can be mobilized in ways that emphasize an overarching common humanity while making the case that some fellow human beings are denied dignity and rights because they belong to a particular group or it can be mobilized in ways that amplify our ancient tribalism and bind people together in a shared hatred of a group that serves as the unifying common enemy bind people together finding a unifying common enemy it's a very common tactic in politics and, and the history of of this you know who is the enemy because if there is an enemy if there is an other i gave you this idea of the other earlier if there is one it makes your group stronger you it binds you together so just staying in south korea um in 1945 full you know with um the fall of the japanese uh colonization here from 1945 to 1948 you had the american uh, military government 1948 was the start of the republic of korea but its cultural continuity had been really disrupted you know if you think before that was the Chosun dynasty from 1392 until 1897 1905 but then there's a gap there's there's a gap in korea's cultural development and so it had to build a new identity it had to sort of get these people together and because the country was arbitrarily divided in half that line it was a uh, bone steel and rusk that got an ep uh, an episode uh, a an addition of national geographic and, and and drew a line across the 38th parallel the the line dividing korea was arbitrary and the people in the south and the people in the north that wasn't a natural division between people they were arbitrary groups and so it needed to bind them together to actually create a nation because before 1948 you know there was no republic of korea it was a new thing it had its first president it was putting you know the taeguki and things like that in there it had to make its its national anthem it had to make its heroes it had to choose its story and to do that to bind these people together it found a common enemy and that common enemy was north korea for the most part sometimes the common enemy was japan you can see that these days that uh, with the president uh, the current administration i would say being more supportive of uh, discussions with the north meeting the north for many diplomatic meetings they need to keep their group together so they still need a common enemy so they can't have that common enemy so they use the other common en common enemy which would be japan and that's very useful for keeping their group you know really tight and collected together so we look now at this uh, idea of common humanity identity politics common humanity the reverend dr martin luther king jr epitomized what we all call common humanity identity politics he was trying to fix a gaping wound centuries of racism that had been codified into law in southern states and into customs habits and institutions across the country 
It wasn't enough to be patient and wait for things to change gradually. The Civil Rights Movement was a political movement led by African Americans and joined by others. Together they engaged in nonviolent protests and civil disobedience, boycotts and sophisticated public relations strategies to apply political pressure on intransigent lawmakers while working to change minds and hearts in the country at large. Part of Dr. King's genius was that he appealed to the shared morals and identities of Americans by using the unifying languages of religion and patriotism. He repeatedly used the metaphor of family, referring to the people of all races and religions as brothers and sisters. He spoke often of the need for love and forgiveness, hearkening back to the words of Jesus and echoing ancient wisdom from many cultures. Love is the only force capable of transforming an enemy into a friend, and darkness cannot drive out darkness, only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate, only love can do that. Compare King's words to these from Buddha, for hate is not conquered by hate, hate is conquered by love. This is a law eternal. It's exactly the same thing that uh, ex-president Kim Dae-jung would do with the sunshine policy towards the north. Uh, use light instead of darkness. King's most famous speech drew on the language and iconography of what sociologists call the American civil religion. Some Americans use quasi-religious language, frameworks and narratives to speak about the country's founding documents and founding fathers, and King did too. When the architects of our republic wrote the magnificent words of the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence, he proclaimed on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial, they were signing a promissory note. King turned the full moral force of the American civil religion towards the goals of the civil rights movement. Even though we face the difficulties of today and tomorrow, I still have a dream. It is a dream deeply rooted in the American dream. I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up and live out the true meaning of its creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. King's approach made it clear that his movement would not destroy America. It would repair and reunite it. This inclusive common humanity approach was also explicit in the words of Pauli Murray, a black and queer Episcopal priest and civil rights activist who, in 1965, at the age of 55, earned a degree from Yale Law School. Today, a residential college at Yale is named after her. In 1945, she wrote, I intend to destroy segregation by positive and embracing methods. When my brothers tried to draw a circle to exclude me, I shall draw a larger circle to include them. When they speak out for the privileges of a puny group, I shall shout out for the rights of all mankind. This common humanity approach, what they're talking about here, is rather than, um, let me start over here, sorry. If you have, you know, some people, it's common for us to try to put us into groups and tribes. That's natural, that's what we're used to. And also it, it provides power and a feeling of safety because you're in a group. And if you're an individual and all by yourself, you get this great fear that all of a sudden you have to live and think and act for yourself. And that can be very disconcerting to some people. This common humanity approach that they're looking at uh, from Murray, the civil rights activist, and Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., is that instead of drawing the circles here, they draw the circle here to include everybody, the common humanity approach. A variant of this ennobling common humanity approach played a major role in the movement that won marriage equality for gay people in several statewide elections in 2012, paving the way for the Supreme Court to rule that gay marriage would become the law of the land, some of the most powerful advertisements of those 2012 campaigns use King's technique of appealing to love and shared moral values. If you want to experience the emotion of moral elevation, just go to YouTube and search for Mainers United for Marriage. You'll find short clips showing firefighters, Republicans and Christians, all appealing to powerful moral principles, including religion and patriotism, to explain why they want their son, daughter, co-worker to be able to marry the person he or she loves. Here's the transcript from one such ad featuring an Episcopal priest and his wife. Our son, Hal, led a platoon in Iraq. When he got back, he sat us down and said, Mum, Dad, I'm gay. That took some getting used to, but we love him and we're proud of him. Our marriage has been the foundation of our lives for 46 years. 
We used to think civil unions were enough for gay couples. But marriage is a commitment from the heart, a civil union is no substitute. Our son fought for our freedoms, he should have the freedom to marry. This is the way to win hearts, minds and votes. You must appeal to the elephant, intuitive and emotional processes, as well as the rider reasoning. King and Murray understood this. Instead of shaming or demonising their opponents, they humanised them and then relentlessly appealed to their humanity. So with this here, they humanised them. Um, it noted that uh, Martin Luther King's junior uh, language was calling people brother and sister. And of course, you know, that's part of the cultural uh, language of the time and things, but it was still humanizing them. It was seeing people as humans using language that you associate with family rather than you go the other way. And if you use labels or epitaphs online, when you don't have these things, when you don't have names, then you dehumanize them. And the point being made here that when you humanize people, you're more likely to feel in the same group as them and therefore you're more likely to help them. But when you dehumanize them, you see them as the other and you put them in the other group, then you're more likely to feel no pain or no remorse when these people are hurt. And so it, it, it's about understanding they're making this point. Common enemy identity politics. So this is the opposite of common humanity. Common humanity form of identity politics can still be found on many college campuses. But in recent years, we've seen the rapid rise of a very different form that is based on an effort to unite and mobilize multiple groups to fight against a common enemy. It activates a powerful social psychological mechanism embodied in an old Bedouin proverb. I against my brothers, I and my brothers against my cousins, I and my brothers and my cousins against the world. Identifying a common enemy is an effective way to enlarge and motivate your tribe. Be interesting to see whether groups can be motivated, motivated without a common enemy. Or if you're not sure, go through a couple of groups that you know and ask them who their common enemy is. You know, think of this party, this group, this group. Who is their common enemy? And if their common enemy is very clear, you know, obviously they've been turning that up recently and they turn it up to bring more power to their side. Because we are trying to understand what is happening on campus, in what follows in this chapter, we'll be focusing on the identity politics of the campus left. We note, however, that developments on campus are often influenced by provocations from the right, which we will discuss in chapter six. Provocations from the right mostly come from off campus, where the right is just as committed to identity politics as is the left. There has never been a more dramatic demonstration of the horrors of common enemy identity politics than Adolf Hitler's use of Jews to unify and expand his Third Reich. And it is among the most shocking aspects of our current age that some Americans and Europeans, mostly young white men, have openly embraced neo-Nazi ideas and symbols. They and other white nationalist groups rally around a shared hatred, not just of Jews, but also of blacks, feminists and SJWs, social justice warriors. These right-wing extremist groups seem not to have played significant roles in campus politics before 2016, but by 2017 many of them had developed methods of trolling and online harassment that began to have an influence on campus events, as we'll discuss further in Chapter 6. As for the identity politics originating from left-leaning on-campus sources, here's a recent example that drew a great deal of attention in December 2017. A Latino student at Texas State University wrote an opinion essay in his school's student-run independent newspaper under the headline, Your DNA is an Abomination. The essay began like this. When I think of all the white people I've encountered, whether they've been professors, peers, lovers, friends, police officers, etc., there is perhaps only a dozen I would consider decent. The student then argued that whiteness is a construct used to perpetuate a system of racist power, and asserted that through a constant ideological struggle in which we aim to deconstruct whiteness and everything attached to it, we will win. The essay ended with this. Ontologically speaking, white death will mean liberation for all. Until then, remember this. I hate you because you shouldn't exist. You are both the dominant apparatus on the planet and the void in which all other cultures, upon meeting you, die. Right-wing sites interpreted the essay as a call for actual genocide against white people. 
The author seems rather to have been calling for cultural genocide, the end of white dominance and the culture of whiteness in the United States. In any case, the backlash was swift and severe and came from both on campus and off. From off campus, the paper received hate mail, calls for resignations and even death threats. More than 2,000 people signed a petition to defund the student paper. Fire defended the newspaper's First Amendment rights. The student editors quickly apologised, retracted the article and fired the writer. The president of the university called the essay a racist opinion column and said she expected the student editors to exercise good judgment in determining the content that they print. In calling for the dismantling of power structures, the author was using a set of terms and concepts that are common in some academic departments. The main line of argumentation fell squarely within the large family of Marxist approaches to social and political analysis. It's a set of approaches in which things are analysed primarily in terms of power. Groups struggle for power. Within this paradigm, when power is perceived to be held by one group over others, there is a moral polarity. The groups seen as powerful are bad, while the groups seen as oppressed are good. It's a variant of the pathological dualism that Rabbi Sachs described in the quotation at the start of this chapter. So it's coming back to this idea of dismantling power structures. Okay, so we can have this idea of power coming back, but the idea that there are structures, their idea that there are structures that go beyond the individual and structures are in place in society and they are placed there by the powerful. And it's these structures which need to be dismantled. And it's these structures which need to be overturned. And these structures might be cultural. These structures might be social. These structures might be legal, uh, you know, according to this argument that's often put forward. A lot of the time now, the structures are not legal. For example, in, uh, in most developed countries, you know, uh, men and women, for the most part, enjoy legal equality of rights whether it's in terms of uh, voting of home ownership divorce um, you know salaries and things like that the idea legally the legal structures have generally been removed and that's part of what would be under liberal feminism that the law is the most important however if it's sort of looking at post-structural feminism marxist feminism these things it's not the law that's important. The structures for Marxists would be the economy. The economy is the structure that oppresses people. For others, it might be uh, the society's norms and values. So what is acceptable and what is not acceptable. And the norms and values might be described as sort of uh, patriarchy or things like this. Either way, it's, it's a call to dismantle the structures based on power. And of course, when you have... Uh, some people at the top and some people at the bottom, as they said, it creates this morality of good versus evil. We're the good guys and you're the bad guys. And, you know, did anyone ever stop to think that instead of you're the good guys and we're the bad guys, we might both be good and bad? You know, we might both be the same in this. It was uh, Alexander Solzhenitsyn in uh, Gulag Archipelago that said the line through good and evil... Right, the line that separates good and evil. Good and evil. Oh, I can't do a G. Uh, Solzhenitsyn in the Gulag Archipelago said, the line that runs through good and evil is not through parties. It's not through political parties. It's not through race. It's not through ethnicity. It's through every human being. We all have the possibility of good and evil in us regardless. Writing during the 19th century Industrial Revolution, Karl Marx focused on conflict between economic classes, such as the proletariat, the working class and the capitalists, those who own the means of production. But a Marxist approach can be used to interpret any struggle between groups. One of the most important Marxist thinkers for understanding developments on campus today is Herbert Marcuse, a German philosopher and sociologist who fled the Nazis and became a professor at several American universities. His writings were influential in the 1960s and 1970s as the American left was transitioning away from its prior focus on workers versus capital 
to become the new left which focused on civil rights, women's rights and other social movements promoting equality and justice. These movements often had a left-right dimension to them. Progressives wanted progress and conservatives wanted to conserve the existing order. Marcus therefore analysed the conflict between the left and the right in Marxist terms. You'll see this in most countries actually where um, uh, the left was previously based on economic issues. You know, the left was the party uh, of the poor, the left was the party of the downtrodden, the left was the party of the workers. And what we're seeing now sometimes in many countries, the left is becoming more focused on civil rights, women's rights and, and social rights. So it's gone from an economic to a social uh, focus, right? So the change has gone from, on the left at least, perhaps you might say, uh, generally has gone from economics, and this looks like a kid's writing, doesn't it, uh, to social issues, yeah, such as that of minorities. And one of the reasons this happens, one of the ways of looking at this change from the left to the new left, is looking through the ideas of materialism and post-materialism. Now, when materialism is important is when People are looking for food, people are looking for security, people are looking for a house. You know, they're looking for the material things that keep their life safe and going. And therefore, when they're focused on material well-being, such as just having food and a bed and a house and not being dragged off in the night by the police or the Gestapo, when you're focused on these things, you don't focus on post-material things. Post-material things like justice, equality, democracy, you don't generally, people don't generally care about them when the material things are not there. You know, it's like that Maslow's hierarchy of needs. So if you look at South Korea uh, during the economic development, you know, ideas such as, you know, gay rights and women's rights and workers' rights you know, these didn't really come up. Of course, you had like John Taylor in 1970 and things like that, but it didn't really change anything. Why? It's not because the people uh, were good people or bad people, but it's because the people's thoughts were occupied with material well-being. During the 1960s, 70s and 80s in a country like South Korea, where they're so concerned, you know, with, with making ends meet, with getting through with making sure the police don't knock down your door and drag you away for being a commie, because those material things were so important, post-material ideas could not develop. Now, I know the economy is very difficult in South Korea, lots of things happening, it's not perfect, but, you know, it's much better than it was relatively, you know? And, and so, in that, people are at least a lot safer, I would say, uh, in terms of the police. You don't fear the police in Korea anymore. And so, because of that, People then have post-material thoughts. Might not be rich, might just be a student with not much money, but you sit at home and you've got Netflix and you've got an iPad and you've got these things, and so then you start thinking about justice and equality and democracy. And it's not necessarily because the person thinking that is enlightened or the person thinking that you know is a good person or a bad person, but it's because the, the material conditions have been... Uh, sated in society. If you apply that materialism, post-materialism thing to North Korea, why don't North Koreans uh, you know, uh, care or complain about justice, democracy, workers' rights and these things? Well, maybe they do. Or maybe they will say it's not part of their culture, which is totally fine. Or maybe they're so worried about material well-being that they don't have time for post-material things. That's why in South Korea, post-material things are coming now they weren't, you know, looking for post-material ideas in 1980 in Gwangju or 1987, you know. They were to a certain extent, I guess, with the Minjung um, uh, and, and, you know, people going into work, uh, factories and things like that, people like Kwon In-suk, um, but it's really sort of coming now. So the left has changed over time from economics to social issues, and it might be explained by material and post-material. Let's have a look at what Marcuse did with uh, the left and right in Marxist times. In a 1965 essay titled Repressive Tolerance, Marcuse argued that tolerance and free speech confer benefits on society only under special conditions that almost never exist, absolute equality. He believed that when power differentials between groups exist, tolerance only empowers the already powerful. 
and makes it easier for them to dominate institutions like education, the media, and most channels of communication. Indiscriminate tolerance is repressive, he argued. It blocks the political agenda and suppresses the voices of the less powerful. So free speech and tolerance, according to Marcuse in his 1965 essay, should only work when people are equal. But if people are not equal in society, therefore, if people are not equal in society, tolerance and free speech should not be sought. Because if you allow tolerance and free speech, the powerful, you know, those who make the rules, they will, you can get into Gramsci and understandings of this, right? Uh, with hegemony, sorry, uh, look at Gramsci and hegemony and those ideas. But they, they control the narrative through these things. And so you have to block free speech to block the powerful, was Mark Hughes's argument. If indiscriminate tolerance is unfair, then what is needed is a form of tolerance that discriminates. A truly liberating tolerance, claimed Marcuse, is one that favours the weak and restrains the strong. Who are the weak and the strong? For Marcuse, writing in 1965, the weak was the political left and the strong was the political right. Even though the Democrats controlled Washington at the time, Marcuse associated the right with the business community, the military and other vested interests that he saw as wielding power, hoarding wealth and working to block social change. The left referred to students, intellectuals and minorities of all kinds. For Marcuse, there was no moral equivalence between the two sides. In his view, the right pushed for war, the left stood for peace. The right was the party of hate, the left the party of humanity. Someone who accepts this framing, that the right is powerful and therefore oppressive, while the left is weak and therefore oppressed, might be receptive to the argument that indiscriminate tolerance is bad. In its place, liberating tolerance, Marcus explained, would mean intolerance against movements from the right and toleration of movements from the left. Treating people differently according to their political ideas because you frame them as good and evil is Mark Hughes's thing, and you frame them as good and evil based on the idea of power. The, the powerful must be evil and the unpowerful, therefore, must be good. What is the reason for that? The idea is power. Marcuse recognised that what was advocating seemed to violate both the spirit of democracy and the liberal tradition of non-discrimination. But he argued that when the majority of a society is being repressed, it is justifiable to use repression and indoctrination to allow the subversive majority to achieve the power that it deserves. In a chilling passage that foreshadows events on Sam Campuses today, Mark Hughes argued that true democracy might require denying basic rights to people who advocate for conservative causes or for policies he viewed as aggressive or discriminatory, and that true freedom of thought might require professors to indoctrinate their students. One second, please. The ways should not be blocked by which a subversive majority could develop, and if they are blocked by organised repression and indoctrination, their reopening may require apparently undemocratic means. They would include the withdrawal of toleration of speech and assembly from groups, and movements which promote aggressive policies, armament, chauvinism, discrimination on the grounds of race and religion, or which oppose the extension of public services, social security, medical care, etc. Moreover, the restoration of freedom of thought may necessitate new and rigid restrictions on teachings and practices in the educational institutions which, by their very methods and concepts, serve to enclose the mind within the established universe of discourse and behaviour. The end of a Marcusean revolution is not equality, but a reversal of power. Marcuse offered this vision in 1965. It should be evident by now that the exercise of civil rights by those who don't have them presupposes the withdrawal of civil rights from those who prevent their existence, and that liberation of the damned of the earth presupposes suppression not only of their old, but also of their new masters. So there are, there are two opposites here. Um, you can look for equality, or you can look to reverse power. Very big difference. Uh, it's, it's often said sort of among socialists or people on the left, uh, there are two types of socialists, you know, not just champagne socialists, but uh, the first type are the people that generally genuinely care for the poor. You know, the first type of socialist is someone who has a great empathy 
for people that are underprivileged, that are working class. Uh, one example might be, say, for ex George Orwell spent a lot of time with the poor. His book Down and Out in Paris and London, uh, you know, Animal Farm. He was very concerned with the poor and their lives, and he wanted to try to humanize them and see them as that. That was one type of sort of socialist way of thinking, to have empathy towards the poor. Another type of socialist, they may come in the same group, but the other type is one that simply hates the rich, that hates the powerful and is jealous of those that have more than others. And these might be grouped into the same political party, but you could see that they would have very uh, different motivations. Yeah? They might both uh, come from the same group, but one is favoring the poor and trying to get equality. The other one might be hating the rich and trying to uh, flip the power dynamic. So if people see a power dynamic and if the lens with which through you analyze most of politics or history or social changes is power, if you use power as the lens through which you see the world, then you're often going to find yourself wanting to be on the top of that power situation. You're going to be able to want to flip that round, you know, and give the other team a turn. But that's, again, not very democratic, is it? You know, if you see power, it's not equality. It's not treating everyone the same. It's flipping it. Some people would go with that. Um, I would say in terms of education and, and propaganda, you, you would only have to look at uh, South Korea's education all the way up until about the 1980s. Uh, students at sort of middle school and high school and even universities uh, during like sort of the Chan, Chan Du Han uh, reign, even during the Park Chung as well, they were forced to take anti-communist classes, uh, forced to do training up on the DMZ uh, and, and to create the other, you know, to really bind people together in an anti-communist ideology. And that was uh, that was really heavily instilled in this country. And there would be no freedom of speech allowed with that. You would not be allowed to access, you know, North Korean radio or North Korean books. If you had a Kim Il-sung book, you would be in deep trouble if you've been to North Korea. So there was this idea of that and this indoctrination uh, coming. It's not just something from the left. In the West, it was from the left, but, you know, it comes from everywhere. But that was Mark Hughes's uh, interpretation of it. The student who wrote that essay at Texas State University may not have read Mark Hughes directly, yet somehow he ended up with a Marcusean view of the world. Mark Hughes was known as the father of the New Left. His ideas were taken up by the generation of students in the 1960s and 1970s who are the older professors of today, so a Marcusean view is still widely available. But why does this vision continue to flourish 50 years after the publication of Repressive Tolerance? In a country that has made enormous progress on extending civil rights to groups that did not have them in 1965, and in an educational system that cannot be said to be controlled by the right, even if Marcuse's arguments make sense to many people in 1965, can his ideas be justified on campus today? In the decades after Repressive Tolerance was published, a variety of theories and approaches flourished on campus in humanities and social science departments that offered ways of analysing society through the lens of power relations among groups. Examples include deconstructionism, post-structuralism, post-modernism and critical theory. One such theory deserves special mention because its ideas and terminology are widely found in the discourse of today's campus activists. The approach known as intersectionality was advanced by Kimberly Williams Crenshaw, a law professor at UCLA and now at Columbia, where she directs the Centre on Intersectionality and Social Policy Studies. In a 1989 essay, Crenshaw noted that a black woman's experience in America is not captured by the summation of the black experience and the female experience. She made her point vividly by analysing a legal case in which black women were victims of discrimination at General Motors, even when the company could show that it hired plenty of black people in factories, jobs dominated by men, and plenty of women in clerical jobs dominated by white people. So even though GM was found not to have discriminated against black people or women, it ended up hiring hardly any black women. Crenshaw's important insight was that you can't just look at a few big main efforts of discrimination. You have to look at interactions or intersections. 
more generally as explained in a recent book by Patricia Hill Collins and Surma Bild. Intersectionality as an analytic tool examines how power relations are intertwined and mutually constructing. Race, class, gender, sexuality, disability, ethnicity, nation, religion and age are categories of analysis, terms that reference important social divisions, but they are also categories that gain meaning from power relations of racism, sexism, heterosexism and class exploitation. So we're looking at power here as was described earlier. Power is still the thing, but then power through different lenses. Power through race, power through class, gender, sexuality, nationality, religion and age. You know, power can be seen through all these. Intersectionality is a theory based on several insights that we believe are valid and useful. Power matters. Members of groups committing acts cruelly or unjustly to preserve their power and people who are members of multiple identity groups can face various forms of disadvantage in ways that are often invisible to others. The point of using the terminology of intersectionalism, as Crenshaw said in her 2016 TED Talk, is that where there's no name for a problem, you can't see a problem. And when you can't see a problem, you pretty much can't solve it. Uh, I very much agree with this, this, this idea here. When there's no name for a problem, you can't see a problem. Let's just take this. Um, just to be clear, yes, power does matter and, and, and power can be abused. Absolutely. Um, when there's no name for a problem, you can't see a problem. When you can't see a problem, you can't solve it. Now, in the last few years in Korea, you've had the rise of Kaptil. Yeah? Um, now, Kaptil was always a problem. You know, if you go back, however, however many decades or something like that, the abuse of power, you know, when the people in the hierarchical relationship... Um, the gaps would mistreat the alls and they would do it physically, economically, psychologically, uh, culturally. But when they would abuse their power in this way, that was always happening. But nobody ever really did anything about it. Why not? Because it always existed. But then all of a sudden it, it got a name. And when it got a name, when it was started, when it became called Kaptil, then people started doing something about it and it started being on the news and we saw um, uh, the you know the terrible stories whether it was related to uh, Korean Air or the gentleman at the uh, computer web hard company whose name I've suddenly forgotten um, but it was always there but it was not named and when there's no name you can't see the problem so they gave it a name and it started giving it so naming things can be very very important it's interesting that sort of jesus and confucius or the biblical and the confucian traditions both place a very big importance on naming things as well naming things makes them come alive it's the classification uh, in the bible uh, god gives adam the the privilege the uh, the the duty or the job of naming all the animals you can name all these and then you are master of them because you named them so it's a very big part of making that world and power structure come alive uh, you know for confucius or in confucianism you have the rectification of names and every you have to use the right name at all times you can't call your professor your your younger brother you have to use the correct title and names for everything and when this is done then there will be harmony so naming things has a big sort of cultural heritage but this is uh, very much true and so the name of intersectionality or intersectionalism has arisen in politics our purpose here is not to critique the theory itself it is rather to explore the effects that certain interpretations of intersectionality may now be having on college campuses the human mind is prepared for tribalism and these interpretations of intersectionality have the potential to turn tribalism way up. So again, just so you don't forget, we had that sort of tribalism can go up and down and what are some of the causes that bring it down or, or, or send it up? They're saying that uh, intersectionality has the potential to turn tribalism way up. See the argument. These interpretations of intersectionality teach people to see bipolar dimensions of privilege and oppression as ubiquitous in social interactions. 
It's not just about employment or other opportunities, and it's not just about race and gender. Figure 3.1 shows the sort of diagram that is sometimes used to teach intersectionality. We modelled ours on a figure by Cathy Pauli Morgan, a professor of philosophy at the University of Toronto. For simplicity, we show only seven of her 14 intersecting axes. In an essay describing her approach, Morgan explains that the centre point represents a particular individual living at the intersection of many dimensions of power and privilege. The person might be high or low on any of the axes. She defines her terms like this. Privilege involves the power to dominate in syst systematic ways. Oppression involves the lived systematic experience of being dominated by virtue of one's position on particular axes. So privilege and oppression. So there's the structure through the middle and the person exists at the intersection. Now, uh, you, you might be on this axis, you know, you might be here. And on this axis, you might be here. And on this axis, you might be here. And you see it would create eventually how much privilege and oppression do you have? You know, if you if you had more up here than more down here, you could actually quantify, measure. <laughs> Thanks, computer. You could quantify or measure people's privilege. So it wasn't just about being one thing, but rather it was about being a combination of things. It wasn't just this Marxist idea of economics, uh, left versus right based on money. OK, there was still uh, a, a conflict going on. There was still a left and a right. But now it's being based on power for some people. And the power is defined about how much privilege you have or how much oppression you have. And that's determined by some of these kind of things. So, you know, you might have all of these things, but not one here, you know, you inferred also. You've got a lot of privilege, but just a little bit of oppression. Yeah. So that's what this looks at there. One way of seeing the world. Morgan draws on the writings of French philosopher Michel Foucault to argue that each of us occupies a point on each of these axes at a minimum, and that this point is simultaneously a locus of our agency, power, disempowerment, oppression, and resistance. The endpoints represent maximum privilege or extreme oppression with respect to particular axes. She analyzes how two of those axes, race and gender, interact to structure schools in ways that privilege the ideas and perspectives of white males. Girls and women, she claim, are effectively a colonized population. They make up a majority of all students, but are forced to live and learn within ideas and institutions structured by white men. Morgan is certainly right that it was mostly white males who set up the educational system and founded nearly all the universities in the United States. Most of those schools once excluded women and people of color. But does that mean that women and people of color today should think of themselves as colonized populations? Would doing so empower them, or would it encourage an external locus of control? Would it make them more or less likely to engage with their teachers and readings, work hard and benefit from their time in school? More generally, what will happen to the thinking of students who are trained to see everything in terms of intersecting bipolar axes, where one end of each axis is marked as privilege and the other is oppression? Since privilege is defined as the power to dominate and to cause oppression, these axes are inherently moral dimensions. The people on top are bad and the people below the line are good. This sort of teaching seems likely to encode the untruth of us versus thy them directly into students' cognitive schemas. Life is a battle between good and evil people. Furthermore, there is no escaping the conclusion as to who the evil people are. The main axes of oppression usually point to one intersectional address, straight white males. An illustration of this way of thinking happened at Brown University in November of 2015, when students stormed the president's office and presented their list of demands to her and the provost, the chief academic officer, generally considered the second highest post. At one point in the video of the conversation, confrontation, the provost, a white man, says, can we just have a conversation about... But he is interrupted by shouts of no and students' finger snaps. One protester offers this explanation for cutting him off. The problem they are having is that heterosexual white males have always dominated the space. 
The provost then points out that he himself is gay. The student stutters a bit but continues on, undeterred by the fact that Brown University was led by a woman and a gay man. Well, homosexual, it doesn't matter. White males are at the top of the hierarchy. In short, as a result of our long evolution for tribal competition, the human mind readily does dichotomous us versus them thinking. If we want to create welcoming, inclusive communities, we should be doing everything we can to turn down the tribalism and turn up the sense of common humanity. Instead, some theoretical approaches used in universities today may be hyperactivating our ancient tribal tendencies, even if that was not the intention of the professor. Of course, some individuals truly are racist, sexist or homophobic, and some institutions are too, even when the people who run them mean well, if they end up being less welcoming to members of some groups. We favour teaching students to recognise a variety of kinds of bigotry and bias as an essential step toward reducing them. Intersectionality can be taught skillfully, as Crenshaw does in her TED Talk. It can be used to promote compassion and reveal injustices not previously seen. Yet somehow, many college students today seem to be adopting a different version of intersectional thinking and are embracing the untruth of us versus them. Why common enemy identity politics is bad for students. Imagine an entire entering class of college freshmen whose orientation program includes training in the kind of intersectional thinking described above, along with training in spotting microaggressions. By the end of their first week on campus, students have learned to score their own and others' levels of privilege, identify more distinct identity groups, and see more differences between people. They have learned to interpret more words and social behaviours as acts of aggression. They have learned to associate aggression, domination and oppression with privileged groups. They have learned to focus only on perceived impact and to ignore intent. How might students at such a school react to the sorts of emails sent by Dean Spellman and Erica Christakis? So it's applying it here to the to the university classroom. And if you you see the world through these intersectionalities and already said that it can be useful and when there is racism and bigotry and homophobia, they should absolutely be uh, eradicated or pointed out and highlighted. Uh, but when you associate sort of the world in, in these type of groups through a power structure and when you come to a university or you come to a, a classroom or a school, you'll immediately start putting people into groups in your mind. Right? And you'll start doing this and there's people here. Naturally, you'll put yourself here. Right? Everybody does. You know, even when um, sort of. Uh, white males will use intersectionality politics. They'll say that white males are the oppressed and they're at the bottom and it's all the other people that are at the top. It works both ways, these kind of things. And so the idea, the political idea from Martin Luther King, which is opposed to Marcuse, uh, you know, is that make a group like this instead of groups like this. Turn tribalism down instead of turning... Uh, <laughs> Turn tribalism down instead of turning tribalism up. Now, as we go through the course, you want to be thinking, well, is, is, is it always good to turn tribalism down? Sometimes should we turn it up? Do we need to unite it? You know, what's the COVID-19 situation doing to us? Is it is it doing this or is it doing this? I've written a couple of articles in the national press recently arguing that it should be doing this and that people during such situations who try to you know, politicize COVID and turn it against different groups it might be quite dangerous, but at least hopefully you're understanding that in politics or in when people act in society, you know, there are different ways of looking at it in small groups or in the large group and in small groups based on what, what are the consequences and effects of doing both of these things and perhaps some of the thinkers that have encouraged both of these. It's up to you to, you know, explore these and go wherever you want with them that you think is interesting. The combination of common enemy identity politics and microaggression training creates an environment highly conducive to the development of a call-out culture in which students gain prestige for identifying small offences committed by members of their community and then publicly calling out the offenders. One gets no points, no credit, for speaking privately and gently with an offender. In fact, that could be interpreting as colluding with the enemy. 
call-out culture requires an easy way to reach an audience that can award status to people who shame or punish alleged offenders. This is one reason social media has been so transformative. There is always an audience eager to watch people being shamed, particularly when it is so easy for spectators to join in and pile on. Life in a call-out culture requires constant vigilance, fear and self-censorship. Many in the audience may feel sympathy for the person being shamed, but are afraid to speak up, yielding the false impression that the audience is unanimous in its condemnation. Here is how a student at Smith College describes her induction into its call-out culture in the fall of 2014. During my first days at Smith, I, was I witnessed countless conversations that consisted of one person telling the other that their opinion was wrong. The word offensive was almost always included in the reasoning. Within a few short weeks, members of my freshman class had quickly assimilated to this new way of thinking. They could soon detect a politically incorrect view and call the person out on their mistake. I began to voice my opinion less often, to avoid being berated and judged by a community that claims to represent the free expression of ideas. I learned, along with every other student, to walk on eggshells for fear that I may say something offensive. That is the social norm here. Reports from around the country are remarkably similar. Students at many colleges today are walking on eggshells, afraid of saying the wrong thing, liking the wrong post, or coming to the defence of someone whom they know to be innocent out of fear that they themselves will be called out by a mob on social media. Connor Friedersdorf, who writes about higher education at The Atlantic, looked into the matter in response to our original Codling article in 2015. Students told him things like this. Students get worked up over smallest of issues, which has led to the disintegration of school spirit and the fracture of campus. And this from another student. I probably hold back 90% of the things that I want to say due to fear of being called out. People won't call you out because your opinion is wrong. People will call you out for literally anything. On Twitter today, I came across someone making fun of a girl who made a video talking about how much she loved God and how she was praying for everyone. There were hundreds of comments, rude comments below the video. It was to the point that they weren't even making fun of what she was standing for. They were picking apart everything, her eyebrows, the way her mouth moves, her voice, the way her hair was parted. Ridiculous. In this comment, we can begin to see the way that social media amplifies the cruelty and virtual signalling that are recurrent features of call-out culture. Virtual signalling refers to the things people say and do to advertise that they are virtuous. This helps them stay within the good graces of their team. Mobs can rob good people of their conscience, particularly when participants wear masks in a real mob or hiding behind an alias or avatar in an online mob. Anonymity fosters de-individuation, the loss of an individual sense of self, which lessens self-restraint and increases one's willingness to go along with the mob. The intellectual devastation wrought by this way of thinking can be seen in a report from Trent Eady, a young Canadian queer activist who escaped from this mindset in 2014. He wrote an essay titled, Everything is Problematic, My Journey into the Center of a Dark Political World and How I Escaped. Edie identifies four features of the culture, dogmatism, groupthink, a crusader mentality, and anti-intellectualism. Of greatest relevance to the untruth of us versus them, he wrote, Thinking this way quickly divides the world into an in-group and an out-group, believers and heathens, the righteous and the wrongchous. Every minor heresy inches you further away from the group. When I was part of groups like this, everyone was on exactly the same page about a suspiciously large range of issues. Internal disagreement was rare. It is difficult to imagine a culture that is more antithetical to the mission of a university. So again, what is the telos or the mission of the university? Uh, we have this idea of virtue signaling, uh, which is a you know a, something that's occurred in politics recently. President uh, Obama said something about virtue signaling, saying that it wasn't actually doing anything; it wasn't really helping push things along. But it's certainly amplified by uh, online social media, uh, especially with anonymity. So you might want to consider that. We never had anonymity really before. Of course, some people uh, would write in pen names and things like that in the past. But when we go back and look at ideas through political science, there was never this um, anonymity 
really before. There was never this idea that people could truly hide behind things. You, you had your ideas and you put them out there and you engaged with other people and their ideas. So how social media ha has changed politics and political science is very interesting, especially you have people such as President Trump who will tweet frequently and often, you know, to appeal to his base and also to wind up and to antagonize his opposition and things like that. And that increases, you know, the divide between people. So how uh, social media affects politics and political science is something that, uh, you know, academics are going to have to grapple with pretty soon. Um, let me find out how much we've got to go. Yeah, we've just got a couple of pages, so we'll finish this. Michelle Alexander, in her best-selling book, The New Dream Crow, Mass Incarceration in the Age of Colorblindness, illustrates what happens to the millions of black men dragged into the criminal justice system, often for possession or use of small amounts of marijuana. They are released into a society where they struggle to find jobs, are disqualified from state benefits, sometimes face the loss of the right to vote, leading to an undercast in American society that is some ways reminiscent of the Jim Crow South. The book has had a powerful impact on the political left, but the issues it raises resonate across the political spectrum. In books like Radley's Bulko's Rise of the Warrior Cop, The Militarization of America's Police Forces, and Fire co-founder Harvey Silvergate's Three Felonies a Day, How the Feds Target the Innocent, libertarians have expressed opposition to both over-policing and the excesses of the war on drugs. The conservative group Right on Crime opposes over-criminalization, mass incarceration and the drug war. There are opportunities for real cooperation on serious but potentially solvable issues. For activists seeking reform, the lesson is to find common ground. Marches and rallies are good for energizing your team, but as Columbia University professor of humanities Mark Leela points out in his book, The Once and Future Liberal, After Identity Politics, they are not enough to bring about lasting change. You have to win elections to do that. And to win elections, you have to draw in very large numbers of people from diverse groups. Lilla argues that the left did that successfully from the presidency of Franklin D. Roosevelt through the Great Society era of the 1960s. But then it took a wrong turn into a new, more divisive and less successful kind of politics. Instead, they threw themselves into the movement of politics of identity, losing a sense of what we share as citizens and what binds us as a nation. An image for Roosevelt liberalism and the unions that supported it was that of two hands shaking. A reoccurring image of identity liberalism is that of a prism reflecting a single beam of light into its constituent colours, producing a rainbow. This says it all. Uh, one of the ideas is, is it's gone from this, and you know, obviously I'm a terrible drawer. It's gone from two hands shaking, from Roosevelt's liberalism on the left, to a prism fracting a single beam of light into a rainbow. So it's split. It's divided them. That's the point they're making. And, you know, this might be good for some people. There's some people like this because it gives them more identity in their group. It allows their group to have, uh, you know, political recognition and, and it gives them historical subjectivity. You know, when you see movements in Korea, like the Minjung movement coming from the Minjok into the political Minjung, it might be seen like that. But here the argument is saying that this change on the left has gone from this to this, from sort of the economy to the politics, right? Yet appeals to common humanity still work just as well today as when Dr. King made them. On September 16th, 2017, on the National Mall in Washington, D.C., a group of Trump supporters organized a rally they called the Mother of All Rallies Patriot Unification Gathering. Sounds very Korean. Counter protesters from Black Lives Matter showed up and shouted at the Trump supporters. The Trump supporters shouted back. Someone on stage told the Trump supporters to pay no attention to the counter protesters. They don't exist, he said. Hank Newsom, the leader of the BLM counter protesters, later said that he expected to stand there with his fist in the air in a very militant way and to exchange insults. Tensions mounted and onlookers recorded video of the potentially explosive situation. Then the Trump rally organiser, who goes by the name Tommy Gunn, took the stage. It's about freedom of speech, he said, and in an unexpected move he invited Newsom and other BLM supporters onto the stage. We're going to give you two minutes of our platform to put your message out, Gunn told Newsom. 
Now, whether they disagree or agree with your message is irrelevant. It's the fact you have the right to have the message. Newsom took the stage. I am an American, he began, and the crowd cheered. And the beauty of America is that when you see something broke in your country, you can mobilise to fix it. But then, as he spoke about a black man being killed by police, the crowd began to turn on him. They booed. Shut up. That was a criminal, a woman shouted. Newsom explained, we are not anti-cop. Yes, you are, people shouted. We're anti-bad cop, Newsom insisted. He still seemed to be losing them. We don't want handouts, he told the crowd. We don't want anything that is yours. We want our God-given right to freedom, liberty and the pursuit of happiness. Now they were coming back around. People cheered. Someone in the crowd shouted, all lives matter, which is usually intended as a rebuke to those who say that black lives matter. But Newsom responded in the tradition of Polly Murray, by drawing a larger circle around everyone in the crowd. You're, you're right, my brother. You're right. You are so right. All lives matter, right? But when a black life is lost, we get no justice. That is why we say black lives matter. If we really want to make America great, we do it together. The crowd cheered and chanted, USA, USA. In an instant, the two groups were no longer us and them. Their ideological differences remained, but within that larger circle around them, their enmity melted away. And, at least for a short while, they interacted as fellow human beings and fellow Americans. It kind of restored my faith, Newsom said when interviewed afterwards. Two sides that never listened to each other actually made progress today. One of the leaders of Bikers for Trump came up to Newsom afterwards and shook his hand. The two men talked and then posed for a photo together, with Newsom holding the other man's young son cradled in his arms. There's a conclusion here that, that goes over the points. You can uh, read them in your time. Obviously, it, it likes to end with uh, an emotive story to try to you know, convince you of these things. It's not the purpose of this to convince you of anything. It's the purpose to expose you to a wide range of ideas and make you try to first understand and then secondly critically analyze them from your own perspective so uh, it's up to you how you go through these things but uh, rather than starting with um, you know Plato or something like that which would be uh, you know a huge jump back 2,000 years or so uh, I, I thought it would be more interesting to start in the modern day and something that was a little bit more in time and relevant i know it's not korean politics but you know I, I wanted to go over some of these ideas of left and right and economy and politics and how things change over time um just to make sure you're aware of the conclusion that they put forward here it's that uh in this event you see the, this online as well it, it does happen pretty much like this from what i saw um the the groups of you know the trump supporters and the black lives matter these groups still existed the conclusion that they're making the groups their ideological difference remained there will always be groups it's 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 inbuilt but one of the things that they were saying is that they drew a larger group around themselves okay so instead of emphasizing this group and the division of us and them and there's these two sides what they did is they said, well, no, what about if we're one thing? So they drew a larger group, and uh, throughout this chapter it says this group can be built on you know, religious traditions, or it can be built on civil traditions, it can be built on legal traditions, um, various other things to build it round. It could be built, I guess, on national traditions. You get a lot of that in Korea, you know. Korea will unite very easily on national conditions. Um, so that's chapter three of, of this book. You're not expected to understand or, or you know, follow all of it. However, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the assignment that I would like you uh, to do as a result of this. Um, let me work out my buttons here. Uh, if we go over here. Okay. So in this introduction to political science on our roster, I'm still getting used to this, but. Uh, I will upload the video here. You've probably already seen that by now. And then below that, there will be an assignment and it will be marked as homework. And I'm hoping you'll be able to upload your work there. If there are any problems, let me know and we'll try to sort that out. Your assignment is this. I would like you to give your feedback on some of the things that you read or understood there. Obviously, we're in class. You would have 75 people 
all with different opinions saying, yeah, this is right, that's rubbish. And you would be hearing them, you know, from boys and girls, from Koreans and non-Koreans. And it would be great for you to be able to discuss that in that environment, you know. And ultimately, that's what I do in my classes. It's a discussion like that where you're expected to listen to other people and put forward your ideas. Um, so unfortunately, we can't do that, but we're going to try and do that digitally as much as possible. Descriptive and normative. Uh Okay, for your assignment, descriptive statements and normative statements. Okay, so you need two types. The descriptive statement is just the fact. Okay, in the book, The Coddling of the American Mind, they said, dung, dung, dung. Right? In the book, it is stated that Martin Luther King advocated common humanity politics. In the book, they talked about this. In the video, Professor David Tizard said this. They would all be descriptive statements, facts, what happened. Once you've got that, once you've got one or two of them, then you put the normative statement. In the book, The Coddling of the American Mind, they describe Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s ideas as common humanity politics. Descriptive. Normative. I think, da 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 da. Right. So you've got those two things there. That's what you're looking. You need a balance of those two things. If your work is all descriptive, it's rubbish. It's just like, it's not rubbish, but it means you understand it, which is good. It means you understand and you've got it. But it becomes like a Wikipedia article or something. It doesn't have any character or personality. They said this, they said this, they said this, they said this. They... Great. On the other hand, if your work was all just all normative, well, I just think this and, you know, I, I, I've got these thoughts and these ideas. Again, that's great. That's, you know, creative thinking. That's interpretation. That's your own mind working. That's perfect. But it needs to be based on what we've studied. You need to show that you've understood some of the text. So you've got to get these two things and put them together. It doesn't have to be 50-50, 60-40, 70-30, 20-80, right? Anything that you want like that. You want to try to get two of them together. How much work you do for this first assignment? Please focus on quality, not quantity. Don't try to impress me with you know, five, six pages that's too much and I've got, uh, you know, three, four hundred students at the moment to do this with. So um, focus, please, on the quality of the work rather than the quantity. You know, you spend more time on it and it will get more condensed and powerful. So uh, just do a reasonable effort. It's only the first week. Um, you can present it, I think, in two ways. Uh, the most, the desirable way, I guess, would be just a written assignment. Just open it up you know, write two, four hundred words or something like that, five hundred, whatever's good for you, um, just on a word file or something like that. So you could write it. The second way that you could do it, if you want, is you could do a video like this. Uh, and most of you are going to go, oh, my God, I'm not going to do that. It's totally fine. But if we're doing online learning and things like this, I'm just trying to encourage, encourage you and give you the opportunity if you want to get into this. This is the first time I'm doing it. I'm very new to it. But who knows how long we might be doing this. So just to give you that, you are also welcome to do it that way. The same thing applies to length. You know, don't send, if you do do that, don't do it 20 minutes or something. I know mine's long, but uh, this is meant to be a three hour lecture. Okay. So please give your critical analysis on this. There's no correct answers. There's no question what you have to do. Show me that you've understood something in this chapter and show me that you've understood something in the lecture. And then give me your interpretation of it. And I don't mind what your interpretation is. I just like it to be based on something that you've understood. Right. So try to get that. If you have any questions or comments about it, if you don't know what to do, if the, the website's not working, just get in touch with me. My email should be up there. Super fun time. Happy snack. Gmail dot com. Uh, my number is 0102105 9382. Um, yeah. Other than that, I think we should all be good. So stay healthy, stay happy, and uh, I hope to see you all soon. Thank you for listening. I'm going to stop this now. Goodbye.